Now we'll get to decorative flame. That's what that is. That's not a real candle. You don't light it with a match. You just push the button. And besides a little LED light that's in there, it has this other thing in front of it. You notice that it flickers. If, if you go like that, it'll even move the flame. As real as it looks, it isn't. And, and there's all kinds of them. You know, you've seen the ones that are fake fireplaces. If, do we have a picture? like that. That's the old style. Now they've got these, the, the new LCD displays that, uh, you know, they make them that look like flames. You can also push a button and it'll look like an aquarium with fish swimming around in it. They, they can make them do anything. But the reality is, they're only decorative. They're fake. I could put anything I want on top of this for as long as I want, and it will never, ever light it. Because it's fake. It's not real. Now, I can guarantee you it won't take very long for this to begin to influence whatever's put on top of it. And if it's flammable, yeah, it's on fire. The difference between the decorative and the real. I want you to consider that for a minute, the difference between the decorative and the real. And it goes a lot farther than just little fake things like this. Since it's Christmas time and, and I want us to remind us what some of the gospel writers have to say and, and, and we're really familiar with what Matthew has to say, and we're really familiar with what Luke has to say about Christmas, but are we familiar with what John has to say about Christmas? John 1.9 says, The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Verse 14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the reality of the one who came into this world. That he was the light of the world. That he was the one and only. The word of God made flesh. The pre-existent, eternal word of God made flesh. That's the real that's the real. But do you know that there were many religious leaders in Jesus' day? And they were merely decorative in their religion. It was all for show. And as we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus publicly, scathingly condemned them, said they were hypocrites, blind leaders of the blind, only concerned with the external things that the public could see. Well, I want us to look at a few things that Matthew 23 records about this. And so I want us to look at verses 13 through 15 first. This is what Jesus was saying about these who are merely decorative. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves." And we could go on down and look at verses 23. <clears throat> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier manners of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain at a gnat swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. 
blind Pharisee? First clean the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bone and all uncleanliness. Even so, you are also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Wow. What a condemnation. Jesus is showing us a lot of faults and failures with those who are only concerned with the external. But I want us to focus on three. Three things Jesus emphasized that these who are merely decorative, what they could and would not do. And so at first I want us to see that they had not dealt with their personal sin. They hadn't cleaned up the inside of their cup. Remember, Jesus said they were oppressing widows, they were full of extortion, self-indulgent. You know, they, they had refused to follow John the Baptist's command to repent. If, if we were to look back in Matthew 3, um, and look at verses 7 and 8, John the Baptist says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. But they didn't. Now the second thing is they were blind to the truth. Remember Jesus said they were blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel? Now, am I the only one here that's been walking fast, running, breathing hard, riding a bike, whatever, and inadvertently swallowed a gnat? You know, you try and spit that thing out of your mouth for five minutes, he's already been down here for at least four and a half. <laughs> Jesus said, they'll swallow a camel. They'll swallow what's impossible, and yet they'll swallow it. They're, they're blind to the truth. And, and let's look at what John chapter 3 re records Jesus saying about this, being blind to the truth. Starting at verse 19, And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. They don't come to truth. They're blind. And the third thing is that Jesus declared... This decorativeness could not bring people closer to God. In fact, he said it the opposite would happen. Remember Matthew 23, 15? You make him twice as much son of hell as yourselves. The effect they have is detrimental. So we're seeing the three failures of a decorative religion. But... For us who are followers of Christ, these are supposed to be powerful realities. These things that are failures on the decorative end, for us who are following the true light of the world, they're supposed to be powerful realities in our life. And so I want to spend a moment considering what New Testament writers instruct about these three things so that we can make sure our personal application is not just decoration. So I want us to first look at Paul's exhortation, it's found in Romans 6, about dealing with personal sin. And we'll look at verse 11 through 18. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. 
And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. He's saying, don't, don't let sin rule over you. Don't let it have dominion over you. Present yourself to God. Now, I, I don't know if you've happened to notice this morning's bulletin, but there's a poem in it written by John Newton. And some of you may instantly know who John Newton is. Some of you might not. John Newton had a, a life of extremes in the sense that his mom died when he was young. His mom was a devout Christian. He had heard the gospel as a, a young lad. But after her death, he was taken to sea by his dad. And through a lot of different events, he at one time and for a period of his life, he was actually a slave. He was actually a slave. And then for another period of his life, he was at the other end of the spectrum. He was the captain of a slave trading ship. And so he saw depravity on a daily scale that most of us cannot imagine. He wrote this, In evil, long, I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed its languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou mayest live. Thus while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace, it seals my pardon too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. Some of you know this is the gentleman that happened to write the song that's still played almost every week, Amazing Grace. Nothing stopped his career of sin except the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is what stopped it. We are to. The cross is not to leave any room for denial or excuse or justification of sin. Only surrender. Maybe I need to say that again. The cross leaves no room for denial, excuse, or justification. Only surrender. Well, you know, since Jesus is the truth, his followers are to be walking in declaring and rejoicing in truth. I, I want us to, to look at some things that are recorded in the later letters of the Apostle John. The first one, I want us to look at 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. 
Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And then John writing at a later time to a brother that he loves, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. This is third John. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Followers of Christ are to be in truth. We're to be concerned about, is every part of my life truth? Or are there some little compartment stuck away somewhere that this is deceit? This is a lie. This is something that's buried right down there, and I'm keeping it there so nobody else can see it, but it's there. That's not walking in truth. We, we need to realize we are to walk in truth. We're to declare truth. We're to rejoice in the truth. And, and every shred of falsehood and deceit and lie is supposed to be pushed out, surrendered. We're to walk in truth. Now, I, I suppose that the power and blessing of light shining in the darkness is a real enough truth that all of us can grasp that. That light shining in the darkness is a blessing. It has great power. Has anyone ever been driving at night, had your headlights to the car, just they're gone while you're still going 60 plus? You'll know the blessing of the reality of lights shining in the darkness. You know that in the 1750s, Benjamin Franklin saw a light on his neighbor's house. His neighbor was John Clifton. And he looked at that, pondered it, improved it, modified it so it would vent better. Go ahead and show the picture. And then proposed it to the city of Philadelphia that they line their streets with those. And in 1757, Philadelphia became the first city in the United States to have street lights. Now, we... We take lights everywhere for common. We take, we take it for granted. We don't even give it a second thought until the power goes out. You ever notice when you're driving around, you're coming down to your neighborhood and it's dark. You know the power's going to be out. But we take it for granted. It hasn't always been this way. Someone had to intentionally shine the light in the darkness. Benjamin Franklin designed that and intentionally went and appealed for that to get that done so they'd have lights on their streets. Do you know that we as followers of Christ were to be doing this? We are to be shining in the dark. The Apostle Paul put it this way to believers in Philippi. Chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. We're to shine like stars. We're to shine like stars so people will be drawn closer to God. You know, the reality of our relationship should shine out from us. And like a real flame, it should influence those around us. If you put a real flame next to something, it's going to be influenced one way or another. Unless it's a rock, it's going to move or catch on fire. So I want us to to see... Not only the reality and example of this happening, but also some components that are absolutely essential for this to take place, for this influence to take place. I want us to take a brief look back into the the book of Daniel. 
And as we, as we do that, I want us to, as a side note, consider that some scholars say Daniel is the one who influenced the wise men of Persia and began to teach them truths that persisted for hundreds of years and that he was the influence that caused those three wise men to show up in Jerusalem when Jesus was born. Now that's just something you can delve into on your own time, but there are scholars that, that have theories for that. Um, but I want us to look at the first four chapters of Daniel. And I want us to consider how Daniel and his friends influenced the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I want you to stop and realize who King Nebuchadnezzar is. He's a pagan king. He's arrogant. He's selfish. He has no regard for the value of human life. This guy is the ruler of the superpower of his day. And before we go any farther, we have to see Daniel's commitment to God. It's found in chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. So we see that Daniel has a commitment to God that he wants to stay pure in his devotion to God because he knows that these other things are more than likely have been offered to pagan gods, and he doesn't want to defile himself with that. He wants to stay pure to God. And he and his friends are all involved in this, and, and they have a different food to drink, uh, eat and drink. We get to Daniel chapter 2, and King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that troubles him. And he says to the wise men, Tell me the dream, give me the interpretation. And I'm not going to tell you the dream. You tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. Well, the wise men come to the conclusion they can't. And all of a sudden it becomes his decision. Well, if you can't, then I'll have you all killed. And so since Daniel and his friends are part of that group, the word comes to them that, hey, <laughs> Put your affairs in order. The king's going to do away with you. And so they asked for time from the king to respond and make known the dream. So they go to prayer. And God reveals the dream to Daniel. And so Daniel goes to the king and in verses 26 through 28. Then the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret of the king has the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, astrologers, magicians, and soothsayers cannot be declared to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your head upon your bed were these. And then he interprets this dream to king, tells him the dream, then interprets it to him. And at the end of that, we're at chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. King answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. All of a sudden, this King Nebuchadnezzar has come to an understanding of who this God is in the sense that he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows the dreams you have on, on your bed at night. And he knows the, the interpretation of them. So then we get to chapter 3, and all of a sudden we're reading that King Nebuchadnezzar has built this 90-foot tall statue out of gold. And he's decided that everybody in his kingdom, when the music is played, is going to bow down and worship this thing. Well, Daniel's three friends, who had this same devotion to God that Daniel does, have decided they're not going to do that. And word comes to the king that they're not going to do that. And... 
He's upset about it. And he said, who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? And their answer is this in verses 16 through 18 of chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. The next few verses tell us about the, the very real flame that took place in Nebuchadnezzar's face and the very real flame in the forge that was being heated seven times hotter for them to be thrown into it and how it burned up the men that were carrying them up there to throw them in. And verse 25, something happened. Look, he answered, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. We get down to verses 28 and 29. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel, delivered his servants who trusted him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So now he has, he's concluded that there is no other God that can deliver like this. So we see that he's come to a conclusion that God is omniscient and God is omnipotent. He's come to a conclusion about the one true God. Then he has another dream, chapter 4. And since he knows who will be able to interpret this dream for him, he goes to Daniel. And Daniel interprets it and gives this instruction that's found in verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So we're at a place where this man already knows the omniscience of God, the omnipotence of God, the reality of this living God. Yet, he somehow is unable to get to the place where he recognizes that he is accountable personally to this one true God. And this brings us to a relevant truth. Once a person knows the reality of the omniscience and the omnipotence, the reality of God, and they ignore and deny the fact that they are personally accountable to him, they're just doing the exact same thing that those that Jesus condemned were. Their response to God is only decorative because they know the reality. If we keep reading here, we see that God in his mercy personally dealt with Nebuchadnezzar and humbled him. Humbled him to where he lost the kingdom, lost his mind, was run away from the home. And at the end... We need to look at his conclusion, verses 34 through 37. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors, nobles, nobles resorted to me. And I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and honor the kingdom, 
the King of heaven, all whose ways are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Nebuchadnezzar began to worship and praise the one true God. So I've shared all of these things with you to ask you a few questions. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe some of you see that you need to accept Christ. You, you know the truth and the reality of, of God. You know that you can't face him and his judgment without the forgiveness of Christ. Christ has already paid the price for your forgiveness. He's offering you abundant and eternal life, but you have to personally accept it. So maybe there's someone here that you just say, I want to accept Christ. I recognize I need his forgiveness. I want Christ. If that's you, just raise your hand. And maybe there's some of us that we need to face some hard questions. Have we put away sin? Or are we denying and excusing and justifying it? Or have we put it away, surrendered it at the cross? And are we walking in truth? Put away every shred of a lie, every deceitfulness, every falsehood from our life that we might truly walk in truth. And is the reality of our relationship influencing others? Causing them to know there really is a God. Because if you're committed to Christ and you're willing to follow him to the very end, regardless of what that end is, people are going to know. They're going to know you're different. Just like Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel and his friends were different. And because of them, he began to experience the reality of God. Are we causing those around us to experience the reality of God? Do we see that as a part of our purpose? So, Father, I ask that you deal with each of us as children. And, Lord, during those times that we need to be humbled, humble us. Lord, in those times that we need to be exalted and held up, hold us up. In those times that we need to receive truth, help us to understand and discern. Lord, that we might walk in truth, rejoicing in it, declaring it, that we might be an influence to those around us. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and keep you.